بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and friends and welcome to the Islamic Literary Society the Islamic Literary Society was founded in 2019 to promote foster and develop a heightened appreciation of authors and literary works of classical and contemporary scholarship this is accomplished accomplished by way of readings book launches talks by pub, published authors and other speakers critical reviews events online discussions and membership meetings the aim is to encourage the revival of islamic readership in our day to day lives and to increase literary awareness among the ILS members and the general public so what do we do well the islamic literary society nurtures interest and zeal in the reading of islamic literature through the promotion of classical and modern books interviews with authors exploration of book reviews and audio and video material providing a platform for writers to showcase their talent a hub for book lovers to share their book interests and showcasing the best in islamic literature the islamic literary society works for the advancement of literature through the contribution contributions of its members and its involvement in important activities the islamic literary society is a vision of prosperity in encouraging the promotion of readership the expression of readers opinions through an intellectual forum and the development of new readers interest in islamic literature please visit our website islamicliteraryssociety.com so i'm pleased to introduce dr muzaffar muzaffar iqbal sorry who is a member of the ils the islamic literary society board so dr muzaffar iqbal is the founder president of the center for islamic sciences canada it was pre previously called the center for islamic science he is the editor of islamic sciences a semi annual journal of islamic perspectives on science and civilization and general editor of the seven volume integrated encyclopedia of the quran the first english language reference work on the quran based on 14 centuries of muslim reflection and scholarship the first volume was published in january 2013 dr iqbal received his phd in chemistry and then left the field of experimental science to fully devote himself to study islam born in lahore Pakistan he has lived in Canada and United States since 1979 he has held academic and research positions at the university of I'm not even going to begin to pronounce that Saskatchewan <laughs> yep I'm not even going to do that <laughs> and the university of Wisconsin Madison and McGill University during 1990 to 1999 he pursued research and study on Islam and its spiritual intellectual and scientific traditions he lived and worked and worked in Pakistan first as director of the organization of the Islamic Conference the OIC which is now the organization of Islamic Cooperation Committee on Scientific and Technological Cooperation and then as director of the Pakistan Academy of Sciences during 1999 to 2001 Dr Iqbal was program director for the Muslim World for his for science religion course program of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences Berkeley USA Dr Iqbal has written translated and edited edited 21 books and published nearly 100 papers on Islam and on the relationship between Islam and science Islam in the West the contemporary situation of Muslims and the history of Islamic science he co-translated volume 7 of Tafhim al-Quran an influential 20th century tafsir he contributed as consultant to concentric cir circles nurturing awe and wonder in early childhood and is one of the founders of the Muslim Educational Foundation Canada a not-for-profit organization dedicated to providing resources and services to educators students and parents for a process of learning built on the Quranic world view he was the series ed editor for Ashgate's four volume work Islam and Science Historic and Contemporary Perspectives Dr Iqbal assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for that very lengthy. <laughs> Alhamdulillah sorry for the mispronunciations of your name and the universities that I I do apologize. It's it's a bit hot in here, but maybe that's just an excuse. But I'm really happy you're here. I've engaged with your work and it's extremely fascinating and 
it is timeless from the point of view that it is extremely important. The way you present the Quran as a trans historical text, as a timeless text, that when it talks about natural phenomena, it's there to point towards the transcendent, to point to the unicity of Allah, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his greatness, his majesty, and how we should relate to him as well. So I, I find it extremely important and it is something that is very timely and extremely needed because a lot of the youth and even academics in this domain of knowledge have basically, I think, slightly moved away from the epistemic goals of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is really for us to understand ourselves in relation to Allah and who Allah is with regards to his transcendence, his unicity and his majesty. So I have a bunch of questions for you. And the first question I, I would like to ask is, Maybe firstly, tell us a little bit about your story, how you began, how you began in your experimental sciences, academic career, and then why you decided to move to focus on the Islamic sciences. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam wa la rasulillah, allama salli wa salli wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajma'in. It's a long story, but the short version is uh, simple. When I was studying chemistry, uh, the fundamental quest was to understand the nature of our being. And uh, uh, this world of chemistry is really fascinating from the point of view of uh, uh, giving us a microscopic as well as macroscopic view of the universe. A small, tiny, little chemical uh, that we can put on our tongue can kill us, like a poison, like a little, just a speck. What kind of power that one little small pinch of uh, arsenic has, why? And then we go into the details of the working of our own body. Biochemistry really fascinated me. Uh, how, 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 how are we created? Like, it's just impossible to think of life emerging from two, little, two little drops. Like, how is possible? You expand that to cosmology to the emergence of the universe from a speck of dust. And then I got interested into, in the beginning of the universe and the philosophical questions that emerged from that. I studied history of philosophy and uh, uh, found it to be unsatisfactory. Uh, then you go into the debates within the Islamic tradition about the origin of life, origin of the cosmos, you study the Western philosophy, Western science, and suddenly you realize there has been a great fissure. There has been a great kind of encounter between Islamic tradition and what we used to call the West, but it's no more possible to call it the West because West is now in the East. West is everywhere. And uh, so what we are facing, uh, what we faced, what our tradition faced uh, was an encounter uh, with the modern world, with a, with a different way of thinking. And then I got interested in that very encounter and I wrote, uh, actually I wrote a, a lot of articles on that encounter and my focus, there is a sort of a focus in my life, in my work, and that is to understand Muslim encounter with modernity. What actually happened at the level of uh, thought, at the level of social change, at the level of uh, education. And uh, that really got me into the question of why. Why did it happen? And the first answer that we came across, uh, we still come across is the following. And this is the answer that is quite late in the, in the encounter. It's actually in the 19th century. 
the reformers of the Muslim world, by that time, most of them had already been colonized. And they said the reason for the backwardness of Muslims is that we lost the edge in science and technology to the West. And as soon as we catch up, we'll be okay. Now, this was a very attractive solution at the time of uh, Sayyid Ahmad Khan in India, uh, Rashid Rada and uh, people like him uh, in the Arab world. Uh, the answer, uh, Jamal al-Din Afghani, uh, the answer in the 19th century uh, was very clear to these people. And so they advocated Western education. And we are all products of that Western education. <laughs> So from, time, from the time of Sayyid Ahmad Khan, like the 19th century onward, the trend has been to acquire Western education. Now Western education came along with Western worldview. And uh, two centuries later, we find ourselves in this dilemma of losing the Quranic worldview through an education system that uh, basically eliminated the ways of being, the ways of thinking that we used to have. Then in the 70s, people realized this 1970s, that is, and uh, there was a movement of Islamization of knowledge. Uh, Allah have mercy on those scholars who realized this and said, we need to recover. We need to Islamize modern knowledge so that we can recover and regain our perspective uh, Islamic perspective on life and the cosmos. And uh, science remains at the forefront of that endeavor. Although when Ismail Farooqi Rahimullah, when he started this mission, uh, he wasn't interested in the, what we call natural sciences. Although that name, the title is not right, but for the sake of convenience, we divide sciences into natural sciences and social sciences. And his focus was social sciences. He thought if social sciences are corrected, the natural sciences would, would already be okay. But that didn't turn out to be the right approach. Nevertheless, this moment uh, really attracted me when uh, 79, 78, just around the time I was, uh, I finished my, my master's. And I did my PhD in chemistry uh, from Saskatchewan. And uh, those were really formative years. And I realized the extent of understanding one can gain in experimental sciences. There is a limit to it. So I could spend the rest of my life in a lab, maybe produce some chemicals, write some papers, but there was no over our overarching solution to the questions, fundamental questions that I was personally facing. And I feel the Muslim Ummah faces, still faces those questions. And that is the nature of reality. That is, how do we understand uh, the cosmos? How do we understand who we are as human beings? Where did we come from? Where are we going? Who created us? And these questions still remain unanswered. So I'm very glad that you are doing research on, uh, you're doing a PhD on, on this question of cosmology. Uh, life sciences, biology is a, is a bigger challenge uh, because it really impacts fundamental Islamic beliefs. Cosmology does too, because if we follow uh, the scientific cosmology, we end up with a cosmos that is utterly independent from the creator. There is no need for God. Uh, we can, we can uh, as Richard Dawkins says, we can smuggle God from the back door as Muslims do and Christians have done, but there is no inherent need for a creator in the scientific worldview. They do have a problem of the beginning which is very old problem, like they need a big bang, they need scientific cosmology doesn't need, have a need for something to start, although now they are saying you can get something from nothing. Now, Aristotle had the same problem. Everyone has the same problem, where do we begin? So Aristotle's uh, solution was simple. He said, matter is eternal. Matter has always existed. Now, if you have a speck of matter, uh, modern cosmology, scientific cosmology, then create the whole universe out of it. 
the the problem with that was if if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is eternal, if He is the first and the last, there was a time when He was and there was nothing. And we have Aristotle saying, well, matter is also eternal. Then we have two eternals. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that our scholars encountered through the translation movement in the, uh, during the Abbasid time, right? A great, a huge amount of Greek learning came into Islam and it really created a huge conflict uh, between the Quranic worldview of a creator and this Greek worldview that was imported through translation. And then uh, over two centuries of conflict, uh, Muslim scholars like Imam Ghazali, for instance, um, who, who really is somebody uh, I'm very uh, attached to, uh, he runs in my blood uh, in terms of my intellectual makeup, uh, People like him, they offered the solution to this huge debate about uh, uh, the conflict in two conflict worldviews. So uh, Imam Ghazali died in 1111, and then in, the, in 1258, we have the Mongol invasion and uh, the whole disruption of uh, the education system and everything. Uh, that was going, uh, the education system that was being established, all of that was disrupted. But Muslims regained, uh, regained from that huge devastation. Uh, it didn't destroy them. As Ibn Khaldun says that actually it was a blessing. The, um, the Mongol, Mongol invasion was a blessing in disguise because the decadence of the Abbasids had reached a point uh, where something like that a jolt was needed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent that jolt. And then the realignment of, uh, of the Muslim social, intellectual, economic whole structure was recreated. And this is where I was also very interested in this whole uh, history of uh, Islamic science or science in Islamic civilization which according to the Orientalist died because, and they still have that charge against Imam Ghazali because they say uh, Imam Ghazali came and he destroyed Islam, science in Islamic civilization, which is historically incorrect because the highest level of astronomical research was happening in the 15th century. That is 400 years after Imam Ghazali in places like Samarkand and Maraga and in Syria. So we have concrete evidence now uh, from later research in the history of science, and this is not done by Muslims, this is by non-Muslims. So this myth of uh, decline of uh, science in Islamic civilization because of uh, Imam Ghazali, people still say that, but that's discarded, totally discarded. And by the way, this was one of the focus of one of those four volumes I, I edited uh, this question of the decline. Anyways, that's a foot, footnote in the history. Uh, what actually happened next is far more dangerous. And uh, that is the 17th century. Now, 17th century is fascinating for me. I, you know, it's still something that we don't completely understand. We have three great empires, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughal empires. And Aurangzeb is at the height of his rule. The Mughal Empire is at the height of his power, dominance, wealth. Everything is going well. Um, Ottomans are huge. They are just huge empire. And uh, although the Safavis are, uh, are limited, both Mughals and Safavis have limited geographical range as opposed to the Ottomans, but still they are regional powers with extreme wealth. But the balance of global power shifts in the 17th century. And there is some truth that uh, Europe gained the upper hand through scientific discoveries. 
Now, those scientific discoveries were translated into technological and economic power. And suddenly Muslim, especially the Ottomans who were in touch, in contact with Europe, they didn't see the paradigm shift. They didn't see this uh, huge change that was happening in the dynamics of the global power. And from that point onward, we have this catching up syndrome too little, too late. This is the classic case of the destruction of all empires. When things go bad, um, they respond with too little, too late. This is what happened uh, throughout that century. Uh, Ottomans, Mughals didn't even try. They were just uh, 1707, Aurangzeb died, and then the internal uh, destruction started. But the Ottomans were desperately trying to reform and counter this challenge that was coming from Europe. Uh, they, were, they didn't succeed. Uh, there, are, there are multiple reasons for that. We don't fully understand the 17th century yet. There are new works uh, coming up about what was happening. Um, and we are also fighting in the reconstruction of the 17th century with this Eurocentric scholarship that says Muslims were backward and the telescope came to Istanbul, but they were not interested. They had the observatory, but they destroyed it uh, because Islam does not allow rational study. So this is the charge. Islam does not allow uh, scientific rational investigation. It's dogmatic. You have to accept the dogma. Therefore, when the telescope came, Ottomans were not interested. The reality is totally different. If, if Islam does not allow uh, rational scientific exploration, how could there be a scientific tradition that lasted for 800 years? 800 years. There is no other scientific tradition in the human history that has lasted for 800 years over such a large span, geographical span, from the Central Asian observatories in Samarkand to Maraga, uh, to India, to you know, the uh, Arab world. Like, it's just fascinating to see that. Plus, anyone who reads the Quran, the invitation to explore, the invitation to go out and look at the signs, it's just endless. Mm. So that scholarship is discredited, uh, but we still have to answer for what actually happened. We haven't recovered and the destruction has actually gone too far now. Uh, what used to be, as I said, what used to be the Western civilization encounter with the Western civilization is no more uh, encounter between Islam and the West. It is everywhere now. Mm. It is everywhere. This, this modern world, our education system, if you look at the Middle East, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Egypt, everywhere. There is no place left on earth where an other kind of worldview is being systematically taught. There are individuals here and there, there are madrasas, but the challenge of a new world has not been met by Muslims yet. And there is a huge number of people now in the West, Muslims I mean in the West, and they are at the forefront of this challenge. Alhamdulillah, there is some good that will come out of it. So this in nutshell is my response to your, your question. Wow. wow, that was very, very, very fascinating. And I totally echo what you said about Al-Ghazali. I think he is a timeless, timeless human being. And his life is an ayah. I really believe his life is a sign for everybody, especially from a spiritual perspective, especially for you know, young aspiring du'at and scholars, when they're online, they have thousands of views and followers. Al-Ghazali noticed some ego, some ujub, some kibar, and he spent 10 years going on his intellectual journey. He spent around two years being a janitor of a masjid. And I say to some of the brothers that if Al-Ghazali, may Allah have mercy on him, he noticed this thing in his heart, and he spent 10 years on the road, then we have to spend a thousand years on the road because we're much, much worse. 
And I consider Al Ghazali a, a, a phenomenon because he was like a psychologist as well. If you read some of his works, he's actually reading you. <laughs> he's like, and he and he deconstructs you and reconstructs you in such a powerful way that if you take what he says seriously, then it's going to be transformational. And with regards to the science stuff, I think if anyone reads his book on the jewels of the Quran, even as a, it's, it's impossible to even claim that he was against <laughs> science. Is. Because he said the Quran is the is the kind of premise or the foundation for right. all of the sciences, and he right. spent some time articulating, you know, the link with the empirical sciences. So that is such a false claim. And also, I echo what you say about the Ottomans and the Islamic civilization. In actual fact, there, there are new works now coming out on science in uh, under the Ottomans, and the and the Ottomans even had their own vaccines, right? So, to and what about Ibn al Haytham? Right, he's he's seen, according to David C. Limberger, historian of science, one of the key milestones for the development of the systematic scientific method. So we, you know, I think a lot of this Orientalism is because of maybe a, a colonial type of you know uh, echo from the past. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely fascinating. So, what do you think with regards to the reason we're we're in this state? So Obviously, the, yeah, yeah. Th there are. There are there are obviously intellectual reasons, but what about spiritual reasons? What about the metaphysical right. reasons? What would you say concerning that, Sheikh? Right, right. I think that is the foundation of everything. Uh, the outward expression of that inner weakness is uh, is obvious. That. Uh, uh, and that can be pinpointed as well in terms of the lack of uh, lack of enough tools to study nature from the perspective of the Quran uh, moving forward from the time of Imam Ghazali, for instance. Uh, see, the reality of the world, the, real, the, the reality of the physical world is perceived through the spiritual lens. And uh, the generations that came uh, shortly, uh, shortly after the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, Sorry. the basira that they had, the inner insight that they had, like the, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu and those who followed them, those those three generations, uh, they did not develop scientific uh, uh, methods as we know them now, but they developed something far more, uh, far more powerful. And that was their own inner understanding of the reality of their existence and the reality of the cosmos. And we see that in Imam Ghazali reflected after centuries of uh, all those things that I mentioned through the translation movement, in minute details, he would just narrow into one single little uh, aspect of huge of the huge cosmos and focus in and draw you into it to transform the heart. I'm always fascinated with his uh, example of the beehive. I remember how he, he, he goes out and he looks at the beehive and he says, oh, these bees are constructing a hexagonal cell. Why a hexagonal cell? Why not other geometrical shape? Why not a circle? Why not a square? Why not a triangle? Like he just draws our attention to something that is so universal. All species of bees across the universe, everywhere, they always construct a hexagonal structure. And then he says, look, hexagonal structure has this shape in which internally the angles are not so sharp as the square. The squares are 90 degrees. Uh, triangles are even sharper. But the, look at the shape of the bee. The shape of the bee is tending towards being circular, being an arch. So it would be impossible for the bee to go into the corner of a square or a triangle and store honey. 
He says, what is the purpose of the hive? To store honey. And what is the most economical, and these beehives are being made with the bee, bees wax. The economy of this construction requires that the shape be such which can store the maximum amount of honey using the least amount of bees wax and bees the, be the most stable. And he says, if you stack the circles, they won't be stable because there will be gaps between the circles. You cannot stack circles without gaps. He says, well, you can stack squares with, without gaps. They will stack e each other, but the internal economy is not right. So hexagonal structure is the only structure that can store the maximum amount of honey using the least amount of bees wax and still being the strongest structure. Mm -hmm. Now, where did the bee get this idea? Where did the bee, when I, when I study that, when I look at the, uh, the evolutionary narrative, the bees of the world would have to have lots of international conferences. <laughs> they publish lots of papers and do lots of experiments to come up with that one single unique geometrical shape, which has a very precise angle of 107.9 degrees oh. all over the world. This cannot happen without the Wahi. And Imam Ghazali then goes and quotes the ayah from Suratul Lahal. Mm. Right? So you see, from the external one observation, he leads to something far greater inside the human heart. If Allah SWT has sent a Wahi to the bees to do this, what about human beings? Oh. Right? So that transformation of the human spirit that then led to the transformation of the heart and the transformation of the character, transformation of the society produced a, a structure in which it was possible for scholars, scientists, philosophers to coexist, mm. debate with each other, talk to each other and keep moving in the direction of well-being at the personal level, family level, level of society. And uh, when uh, second greater, much greater encounter happened uh, with the Western civilization, in the 17th century, they gained the upper hand and they started to arrive in the Muslim world, as you know, first as traders, and then what happened, we all know that. Now we cannot really blame the thieves. We have to blame our own weakness. We have to believe, believe, you know, we have to blame our own weaknesses because dangers are always there. Uh, if somebody breaks into our house, our house has to be strong enough to resist that. Um, so the, that process uh, is really uh, sad and fascinating at the same time. Fascinating in the sense that when the intellectual challenge came from the Greek civilization, Hellenistic learning, uh, Muslims were able to take that huge amount of translation and rework, transform, discard what did not uh, what was not in harmony with their worldview, take what was useful and transform it. Mm. The second encounter, when that happened with the Western civilization, uh, it coincided with other weaknesses, economic, political, military, all kind, and, and moral and spiritual weaknesses. And uh, this is a unique combination of, uh, of different kinds of factors coming together. And we haven't recovered from that yet. Mm. I think what's very fascinating, what you mentioned about Al-Ghazali, may Allah have mercy on him, is the way he linked the natural phenomenon, in this case, the bee and the beehives, to something that transcends the natural phenomenon. And I think this is the kind of answer i believe moving forward as a muslim community in our intellectual discourse is that we're not necessarily denying the empirical sciences or the conclusions what we're saying is you have to revive the correct lenses in which to understand the scientific conclusions of the empirical phenomena and now obviously the kind of typical popular scientist or science lover would say especially if the kind of 
have, a, have an affinity to philosophical naturalism or atheism, they will say, no, no questions like this. We're methodological naturalists, do not refer to the divine, or we're philosophical naturalists, there is no divine. But they forget that the door swings of both ways. They have metaphysical commitments. They may not regard them as metaphysical commitments, right. but they say, but it is a metaphysical commitment. They have those lenses already. Don't talk yeah. about God. Don't link it to the transcendent. I think what we need to do is accept the science, which we do, and also understand the limitations of science and the philosophy of science. That it's not absolute and it may change. Even if you're a, sci a, a scientific realist, they're not, they don't believe that it's infallible. It's fallible. It could still change. And they know just because something works and it's successful, it doesn't mean it's going to be absolutely true for all times and places. Even Dawkins says this in one of his books that in the future, we may just... Uh, change Darwinism, the Darwinian mechanism beyond any recognition uh, because of new observational data. So, you know, this fluidity of science is something that we need to bring back into the public discourse to show to people this is not wahi, yeah? And what we need to also insert, I think, which uh, the example you gave us is phenomenal, is that let's revive the Quranic questioning because Allah t gets us to think. When we look at all of the ayat in the Quran concerning natural phenomena, either before or in the middle or after, Allah is giving us certain conclusions, certain epistemic goals about exactly. how we should relate to Allah and who Allah is. So we now need to be brave enough to think, okay, Allah has given us the referent, what is Allah ref referring to, the cosmos and what's within it and what's within ourselves, but he gives a metaphysical conclusion. We now need to reflect and ponder to create those logical links and revive that in our discourse. And that is what's been missing because we are... We have become intellectual cowards to a certain degree, even spiritual cowards. We're not saying what Al-Ghazali was saying. Why on earth is it a, 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 hex, a, a hexagon? Why, you know, how could it be, just like what you said in the beginning, that, you know, a few drops or dust or, you know, non-conscious, cold, blind, non-intentional forces can create consciousness. Right. And, and they ignore that because of metaphysical commitments. But we need to bring the correct metaphysics, which is the Quranic paradigm. And this is why I think your work is extremely important. So with regards to your work, Sheikh, how do you think your work has impacted academic and popular discourse? So in the, uh, in the 80s, uh, especially with the renewed revenue from oil, <laughs> Uh, there was this huge movement to uh, you know, what you were re referring to at the beginning, the Ajaz al Ilmi, uh, and that whole effort was to reinterpret the Quran and uh, the Hadith of the Prophet Sallam, in the light of modern Western science, rather than do the corrective epistemological uh, correction in Western science, uh, these people, they, they were already impressed by, <laughs> by the sciences. So they said, Western science, they said, okay, we have to reinterpret the Quran itself. And the principles that they used uh, were, total, were in total disconnect with 1400 years of scholarship of interpretation of the Quran. Absolutely. Now we have a vast, vast, uh, uh, vast amount of literature on the interpretation of the Quran. As you know, this has been the focus of the Muslim Ummah for us, and it will remain the focus of the Muslim Ummah, inshallah, because the, the word of Allah is solid, uh, sabit, it's not going away. Uh, all these efforts were really disturbing to me when, uh, when I started to write. There's a chapter in this book, uh, Islam and Science, on, uh, um, on the scientific tafsir, and uh, I, I, I remember the day I wrote, I, it's been 2001 is when I wrote it. Uh, the, first, uh, the first paragraph has this line which says that uh, the new discourse tried to lodge itself in the heart of Islamic thought by uh, this effort of reinterpreting the Quran uh, through Ijazul Ilmi. Uh, so, so this whole effort actually uh, uh, is an effort that follows the Christian attempts to reinterpret uh, the Bible. And uh, recently I wrote a post on, on that as well about how the Prophet warned us about not following in the footsteps 
uh, of those who have come before us uh, step by step and hand span by hand span. He, he said, we, you are going to do that. And uh, everything that is being done uh, in terms of reinterpretation of the Quran and the Hadith, uh, you, you can see the parallels uh, with what has happened with the, with the Bible. The difference is that we know the gospels, the four gospels of the New Testament were written by human beings. We know those four human beings. We also know, and biblical scholars know that the Old Testament is also a re human reconstruction. So these are not the divinely revealed Torah and Injil. These, this is known um, by the biblical scholars. Whereas the Quran, everybody knows that this is not a human text. So we cannot have the same tools to study the Quran as modern biblical scholarship. These are two different texts. So what is what, what was happening, uh, and it is still happening to some extent, uh, was to apply the methodologies uh, which were used by the Christians, Islamize them, and just change the terminology and say, OK, you see, uh, Quran says this, and uh, modern science says this, and then we are all in uh, harmony, so let's have a party. <laughs> Many, these people invited uh, people like uh, Keith Moore, a yes. Canadian uh, um, embryologist. Uh, yeah, to, to Jeddah. Like, they were hosted in palaces and they were given these ayahs about the Nutfa and Mudga, and uh, yes. they had this, uh, this ultrasound image. Uh, of the of the human being in the womb, and then you say, "Oh, we found it. This is Mudga right here, mm. right?" So that kind of superficial approach uh, is, I think, it's now gone, mostly gone, but it's still taking making its way in biological sciences. The problem, I, the fundamental problem between the two worldviews, is the following: modern cosmology gives us an understanding of this huge cosmos that is absolutely lifeless, inert, in terms of its response to a creator. We cannot have mountains doing the hymn with Dawud It's impossible to conceive a piece of wood that would start crying when the Prophet stood in the, on the member instead of holding that piece of wood. It's impossible for the stones to say, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. It's impossible for the oceans to split with the staff. It's just impossible to conceive uh, any kind of miracle. So we have no choice but to deny the miracles or reinterpret them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is wise and powerful, he knows the future. So he knew there would be a time when human beings would try to say, well, it's all very normal. Two plus two is always four. You put these two, two liquids together and you have a human being in the womb. So what did he do? He left one single example that nobody can deny. Isa alayhi salam. You can deny, okay, you can deny Adam al Islam, you can come up with some kind of, but how are you going to deny Isa al Islam? Christians cannot deny it, Muslims cannot deny it. He is an example, like a firm full stop on the road. How are you going to explain such things, right? Because nobody's going to come up with any kind of answer, although they try, but these are not. So, Quran has tremendous number of such examples. And they cannot be explained away with any kind of sophistry, any kind of um, acrobatic kind of uh, motions here and there. So we have, alhamdulillah, we have a solid text uh, that uh, is not going to go away. But Muslims need to do, I think, is to look at the root. Because if we go to the branches, we are never going to, there, there would always be a tremendous number of areas. Imam Ghazali, one thing Imam Ghazali teaches over and over, it's like the journey. So he gives us 10 examples from the world of nature, ajaib. And then he say, oh, but wait a minute. O Salik, O Traveler, if you are going to run after example after example, you will get tired. This mm -hmm. ocean is vast. Get out, just take one single, one single speck and you'll find the whole thing in it. 
because the, the desert is full of sand. And if you're going to examine every single speck of sand, your life would be wasted. Just take one speck, draw your lesson and move on. So if we go to the root and we, we say, well, yes, all we, we now understand the physical world as modern science has proven, this is a collection of atoms. Atoms are collections of smaller particles, uh, neutrons and protons and electrons, and even smaller than that. Um, all of those things are one way of looking at the physical world. In addition to the physical powers, physical forces, and the fundamental forces, there is something else that comes into existence when the parts are joined together. The whole is bigger than the parts, as they say. Mm -hmm. The spirit, the ruh that is there, about which Allah SWT didn't give us the knowledge, is in everything. There is a different kind of ruh in the hewanat. There is a different kind of ruh in the jamadat, in the nabatat. All these realms are connected with the divine. All these various levels of existence have their own way of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lahu maafi samawati ma maafi lahu. lahu maafi samawati ma maafi. They have their own tasbih. We just don't understand it. Hmm. And this is not any kind of fake superficial spirituality. This is the reality of this cosmos. Hmm. We need to develop tools to understand that reality. Yes. And what's very interesting, what you mentioned about Isa alayhi salam as the full stop. I also believe that the full stop is ourselves. We have inner subjective conscious experiences. Everyone, most philosophers of science consider this to be a first person fact. Right. And the big question is the hard problem of consciousness, which is based on two questions. What is it like for a particular conscious organism to have a specific inner subjective conscious experience? And why does an inner subjective conscious experience arise from seemingly cold, blind, non-intentional uh, physical stuff? They can't answer that question. The physicalist approaches can't answer that question. So they kind of move away from it, right? And so ourselves, consciousness itself, it emerged from seemingly non-conscious. It's not aware of itself, not aware of something outside of itself, the, the, the physical processes and the electrons whizzing around. There's no intentional force directing them anywhere, according to the physicalists and the naturalists. So how can you get consciousness emerging from that? There must be something else. You're the one who's pointing the finger at God. There are three fingers pointing at him. And they don't even realize that we have this amazing miracle called consciousness itself which I think is the kind of final frontier and they, and they can't really deal with it from that perspective. So uh, this is very fascinating. I mean, uh, I would advise the Islamic Literature Society, uh, society to uh, have uh, spend at least 10 hours with you because there's so much to unpack, but unfortunately we have to continue with the questions. So your book specifically, Islam and Science Explorations and the Fundamental Questions of Islam and Science Discourse. I've taken this uh, excerpt and I think it's quite fascinating. You write, since all things exist through and because of God, their ontological dependence on the creator simultaneously ennobles them by raising their status from being mere things to signs of a transcendent real, al haq who nevertheless remains beyond them. Thus, rather than being mere dialectical utterances, the sign verses of the Quran have an irresistible urgency which draws our attention to that which lies beyond the phenomena being mentioned. The creation uh, of them in the, uh, uh, is one of the simplest in the sense that it relies on self-evident fundamental facts. The modalities of creation are not explained anywhere in the Quran. It simply states the basic facts. The cosmos came into existence as a sign. The order of nature is therefore an evidence and a pointer for that which lies beyond nature the very source of that order. I appreciate there was a bit of a, uh, uh, um, a copying error that I did, but the point here is this summarizes, again, what we've just discussed is the approach that Muslim intellectuals 
and public speakers should take when they're looking at the natural phenomena that the Quran tells them to look at and when they're looking at the sciences to be brave enough to revive this important meta, these important metaphysical questions that what is all of this pointing towards? And I think your book has done a great service conceptually and everyone should take it and plant seeds in the heart and mind so they can continue this intellectual journey to revive this discourse. And, and, and it happens a lot because remember we're social beings. So when a scientist does great science, he will be in awe of the scientific conclusion. This for me is what I call a primitive intellectual endeavor. The higher level of intellectual endeavor as proclaimed in the Quran is to ask the bigger meta question. Well, what does this, what does this mean about the, the nature of reality? The nature of being? What, is it, what does it mean about, you know, how did this come into play? Who is responsible for this? And I think these questions are fundamental in, in, in our future discussion. So, if someone's going to read this book in particular, what advice would you give in order for them to say it's someone's watching this, they're, they're a future intellectual, they're inspiring academic, they're practicing Muslim. What advice would you give in order to use some of the concepts of this book to continue that journey? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I think the, the discourse on, uh, uh, on Islam and science has reached a certain level uh, of uh, maturity, although there are some people uh, now trying to reinvent uh, Darwinian uh, or theistic evolution one more time, uh, they have disappeared, but there is, uh, there is a new effort uh, now again. Uh, these things will come and go. Uh, but the, the answer that needs to be, I think, done, uh, it needs to be given is at two levels. Uh, what I call tyranny of science, that needs to be broken. And by that, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm working on a conceptually working on a book, new book called uh, Living Islam in the Age of Science. And uh, the tyranny of science is this uh, uh, epistemological authority, the power that has been given to science. And this uh, this is in the in the social realm. This is in the common domain, whether east or west. Everybody believes now that science has answers to everything. And uh, recently, uh, I, I wrote something on this uh, aspect of the uh, the power conceived power of science. Uh, you know, in uh, in the Quran in the description of Musa alayhi salam going to Fir'aun, there is a graphic description of, in Surah Al-Shura, of Musa alayhi salam addressing Fir'aun directly. Now, Fir'aun is the, is the, like the super native metaphor of, of, uh, of a self of a human being gone mad. <laughs> yani he, he claims to be God. Anarabukum alala, right? He, 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 he is the uh, epitome, he is, um, he is the symbol of transgression to the nth degree. A prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Firaun, who has no, uh, Musa alayhi salam, who has no power, physical power, but he has spiritual power. So he goes to Firaun and he's, he invites him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Firaun, what does Firaun say? He says, Marrabukum. Look at the language. He doesn't say man. He mm. says ma. Yani what? He, 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 the haughtiness, the pride, the arrogance, right? In that whole graphic scene, we actually have the power of Fir'aun behind him in the form of magicians. Because his ultimate response is, oh, this man is a magician. When he sees the, the staff, when he sees the miracles of the staff, he says, oh, he's a magician. And we need to have magicians against magicians. So he calls his magicians, the magicians are standing behind him as the symbol and of his power. He himself doesn't have the power. Power is behind him. And therefore, this graphic scene recently came to my mind when I saw uh, this during the COVID, initial days of COVID, uh, 
thing pandemic initially uh, donald trump refuted it but once he accepted it day after day after day this press briefing from the white house you would see two people standing behind donald trump donald trump is like the pharaoh he's like the power symbol but the power is not in his being the power is behind him who are these people every single sentence that he would speak oh science tells us this science is telling us we will beat this virus with science we have the power of science and these two people who symbolize the power this is the power of science just like the magicians of uh, firaun they were shallow they didn't really have power these two people are not even scientists they are public health officers <laughs> they are not scientists but the common people the narrative was the power of science and everybody believes in the power of science right everybody including the muslims so this age of science is like the age of jahiliya when the idols had this pseudo power or the age of magicians in egypt when the magic magic had the power so these these are pseudo powers constructed by human understanding of a fake appearance you see this this uh, this new telescope so far out there muslims are asking oh is it going to change our concept of the universe no just read imam ghazali this is one more speck being in, being examined this mm. is one more thing draw lessons from it this is going to change nothing because our understanding of the manifest world is just this is just still the manifest world no matter how many how far it goes it if it needs 13.5 billion years for life to have evolved as they say over this time we still have the same six days of creation they just happened to be 13 billion years ago there is no problem in understanding creation in six days the quranic narrative of six days of creation does not mean that the whole history of human of the cosmos is six days whether six eras or eons or whatever we want to do it it just means that whatever initial conditions allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set from nothing kun fayakun to bring into existence from nothing creation is the greatest greatest proof of the existence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes right so this new discovery is nothing but the, what we need to do is deconstruct the power of science and put it within its limits number 1 number 2 there are things beyond science as shakespeare told us there are more things in heaven <laughs> than than your philosophy can dream of <laughs> any uh, this is really true there are more things in in heaven and earth than science can dream of it's just it's just amazing to see how we have reduced how we human consciousness has been reduced to one little speck of the creation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the expense of discarding alim he's rabbul alamin like we don't even know what that alamin means mm. we have just one light, little tiny little and we have made a mess of the of the one planet that yes. allah has given us and yani this is look at the look at the injustice this is the human consciousness part of it if we can spend 10 billion dollars to send this one little explorer out there and people are dying of hunger next door yani what kind of earth is this of course and it's even worse that it's even worse when they get the images back they don't even ask the right questions to form the correct conclusions that there is a master in their lives and there is the there is a lord of the heavens and the earth right that, and it's like it's like a form of compounded ignorance like al-ghazali made this very clear yes, about yeah, the the dahriya right the dahri is the the kind of you know old day philosophical naturalists when he i think he described them as ants walking on uh, a book yes they they just reduce everything to what they can see but the one who is writing or can read the book they see that there is meaning and there is someone who's written the book and that's today's age unfortunately sheikh we have been duped and, and deluded and it's very important that when muslims look at these images and they look at natural phenomena that they ask the very critical intuitive and rational questions who did that and what does it say about the one who did that 
Allahu right. Akbar. Allah is greater, right? right. You know, we have right. you know billions of stars and galaxies, and we have to ask these questions. We we're not looking beyond our own noses, right? And I think, I think that, one of the one of the yeah. problems that uh, that has been with this whole discourse is that very, we have very few Muslim scholars who are who have studied science or who who have systematically studied who have been inside the scientific tradition, who have understood the philosophy of science, the epistemology of science, who have history of science, uh, and who are not afraid of science, who are not, who are not like this, looking at science with some kind of awe. Yes. Right. So in order to do that, you have to study. And I, and I'm very convinced that these brilliant scholars of, of Tafasir and language and all, if they spend one year just study science, just understand what modern science is. In one year, you can just master it. Mm -hmm. And then know, know the history of science as well, philosophy of science. I think this has been a major, major problem with Muslim intellectuals that without mastering, uh, without mastering the science itself and the history of science and philosophy of science, there remains this awe of yes. science. Yes. You see? That part is very critical, and Absolutely. I'm very glad that there is new generation of uh, scholars uh, who who are not afraid of science, who are not overawed by science, yes. who can see science as it is. Like there is no problem in in uh, in understanding what the what the science has discovered. There is truth to it at certain level. Uh, you know, there, there is a, this is the reality Absolutely. Uh, of how Allah Subhanahu wa has created it. And I think it's important when you mention about the Ijaz al ilmi movement that it was it coincided with the post-colonial trauma that the muslims were suffering and you had the likes of malik bin nabi and rida and others and kawakibi who actually tried to form formulate a kind of uh, empirical scientific perspective on the quran and claim that there are some kind of scientific miracles which we obviously know they had you know almost non-negotiable metaphysical and epistemological false assumptions bringing to the quran right. and you know, what was interesting when you mentioned about Dr. Keith Moore and yeah. about, for example, Alaka, yeah, in yeah, Surah yeah. Noon, uh, chapter 23, verse 14. What's very interesting, how does Allah end that verse? Allah says Allah is the, greater, the greatest of, of creators and that resurrection is a fact. That's essentially what Allah yes. is sending us. So what we've done, we've committed an epistemic vice. It's not virtuous. When you read a text and the text producer is telling you this is the conclusion and you totally mm. ignore it, mm. you're literally ignoring the text. And in this case, we're ignoring what Allah is telling us. So when you reflect on Allah, you're supposed to conclude that Allah is the greatest of creators because I'm supposed to have come from this seemingly blood clot. And look at me now, I have consciousness and language and, and ability. Wow. You know, Allah has formed me through a set of processes, but through this seemingly dead blood clot so allah is the greatest of creators right. also if allah could create and and put within us consciousness and rational insights from this seemingly dead lump of flesh then obviously resurrection is going to be easy right so right. Th this is the way allah wants us to think so these to be to accept the science accept the blood clot you know from that perspective but ask the quranic questions get people right. to ask them so it could right. open within themselves and cloud the fitrah so they could realize the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fact that we just have a pixel, Allah has the picture. Right. So yeah. one of the greatest uh, violence also was to try to prove that the Quran is the word of God because the Prophet ﷺ could not have known these scientific details. Therefore, he did not write uh, the text and it therefore it proves that this this is a very flimsy foundation to prove the divine revelation because there are people who have pointed out well but the quran also says this which is scientifically yes. incorrect it's so probably. our belief in the divine revelation is not on the basis of this or that scientific fact and this again was uh, the awe and the horror that science created in these people's consciousness that if yes. science can prove this then this is which is obvious but you're right Sheikh. the second point you made which i want to reiterate to the audiences is learning about the philosophy of science because when you learn the philosophy of science and these are not these are not controversial views for example even something basic like the problem of induction 
like you may have another observation that is that is at odds with your current conclusions based on limited information when you study, for example, the epistemic status of theories, realism, anti-realism, instrumentalism, even the, the realists, they would say, yes, you know, we believe successful theories with predictive power and lots of confirmations are a representation of reality, but it can change. And it has changed historically. And just because it works, it doesn't mean it's true. These are right. basic small points. So, you know, the, way, the work that you've done to show the Qur'an is transhistorical, it's timeless, it's absolutely phenomenal, and your advice is, is extremely important. And mm -hmm. this has really motivated me that I, 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 I recommend all the listeners, you know, I know you're very busy, to invite you on multiple podcasts on multiple platforms because your voice needs to be heard. And it's a shame, even coming from a personal point of view, I became Muslim about 20 years ago. And, you know, when I was on my journey, I, I, I would have wished to have access to your books much earlier. But such is such is the the wisdom of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's great to see you, Sheikh. May Allah Amen. preserve you and grant you and your family the best in this life and the best in the life to come. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala put barakah in every single word that you write. And I'm looking forward to the the the, the new work that you're going to be producing. And uh, the, just as a final piece of advice, um, so you could close on this, and um, the listeners of the. Islamic Literary Society, uh, what advice would you give them generally with regards to the spiritual journey living in the West, which is the whole world now? Yes, yes. I think the, the most important thing we need to do in this age is to put filters into what is being bombarded uh, to our consciousness. I find uh, this bombardment, I, I, I have lived a uh, lot of years away from the daily hustle and bustle, and uh, it's only recently that even I, that I got a cell phone. I, I, I just don't uh -huh. like the invasion of my life with news, images, content uh, that I haven't chosen. So you wake up in the morning and you are suddenly bombarded by tens of images, news items, this, this multiplicity uh, of uh, information that sometimes we take for knowledge uh, is, is something that we need to learn to process. We need to have filters. And uh, like every single day, there is this, this, this expectation of something, um, something new, something great, something now we have this telescope going up there, we have something new. But you know, timeless, timeless truths are timeless truths. They are always there. And uh, so we need to protect. This is one of the aspects that I inshallah, intend to write a chapter on, uh, living Islam in the age of science. Uh, the disturbance that uh, technological advances have produced in the human life on a daily basis, not to mention the food we are eating, the gen genetically, genetically modified uh, stuff that has been produced, all the, all the other things that invade our lives. But just at the level of the intellect, at the level of emotions and spiritual life, we need to have a calm, inner, uh, stable life with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the center of that life. Therefore, filters uh, are needed for for us to protect ourselves, inshallah, from, from this uh, new kind of invasion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you rewards. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this uh, event and uh, make it acceptable to and write it in our good deeds, inshallah. Ameen. Ameen. Jazakallah, uh, Sheikh Dr. Uh, Muzaffar Iqbal, and Jazakallah for the viewers for listening. I just want to invite you again to visit the ILS website, the Islamic Literary Society website. You can write rev reviews, get involved. Jazakallah here for watching, and we will see you in our next episodes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.